Okay, Shavua Tov, Gatavach. Welcome everybody for our weekly uh, shir on the Parsha, where we hope to, um, to make sense of an idea in Torah teachings that's going to enhance enhance our lives. And this week we definitely have such a concept. Now, we all know Shabbos is a day of rest. We all experience it. We look forward for that, you know, that day off, that quality time that we can have Shabbos. Ask any Jewish child, why do we keep Shabbos? So what's a Jewish child going to tell you? Hmm? You were once a child. <laughs> and we're still Hashem, children. Hashem rested, so we rest. Oh, exactly. Hashem rested, so we rest. Exactly. Beautiful. So we do the same. But how much sense does that make? What does that mean exactly? We accept it in our innocence of youth, which we should, absolutely. But uh, now that... Uh, we have um, grown up a little bit. We need to understand what that means exactly. Well, let's uh, let's explain. Let's uh, ask the question. If it's a day of rest, because God rested, so then what should define the day is just those things of relaxation, right? Why are there other activities like making a Shabbos meal? Why is there other things like, you know, learning Torah and praying at greater length on that day if it's solely a day of rest? So relax, take it easy, chill, as the modern vernacular suggests, right? If that's all what it is. But there's even a more fundamental question. God worked for six days. And he rested on the seventh. Okay. What does that mean? Why did he rest on the seventh? He got tired. We humans, we understand that when we overwork, we need a day of rest. We need to kind of, you know, uh, let go of uh, the weekday activity that might be over, overbearing, might be, you know, too much. We understand that. But what does it mean God rested? Rested from what? It's too much, too hard. Or he knew it's going to be hard for us, so he rested on our behalf, so we should rest. It's like circular reasoning. Can't be that. So what does it mean that God rested? Furthermore, what, what is the connotation of resting? Anybody? What does it imply? Well, I, resting, I, resting, I, 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 aren't you, aren't you um, connecting to the holy on Shabbos as opposed to the? Well, well uh, don't go off in your own ideas right now, Andrew. <laughs> what is what? Not that your ideas are good. They're good, mm -hmm. but. Uh, my question is, resting implies what? That you work. That you, well, that you, you stop. Yeah, you resting, stop. Resting, resting just implies relax. You stop. Like a vacation. I need a vacation. That's too much. You know, what I've been doing for the last two months or the last, you know, 14 months of COVID. You need, I need a vacation from COVID, right? I need some downtime. Just take it easy. But what's another aspect of Shabbos? As you were saying, Andrew, it's a, it's a holy day. To connect. Mm -hmm. Holy day and a day to take it easy are polar opposites. How do they, they don't seem to stim, as we say in French. They don't seem to connect. 
So is it a holy day or is it a day of relaxing? How do we make heads from one thing and tails from the other thing that seemingly they don't really connect with each other? And what makes Shabbos holy? After all. So we have a few questions over here. So let's repeat the questions. If Shabbos is a day of rest, then what is it that we are implementing in Shabbos? More prayers and Torah learning, um, festive meal. What has that got to do with the downtime? Okay, furthermore, what does it mean that God rested? How are we supposed to take that? We understand from the human condition, our need to rest. But God didn't rest in order that we should rest, but really he doesn't need to rest. So what does it mean he rested on the seventh day? That's our second question. Third question is, again, we have a seemingly two polar opposites over here. Rest implies a casual relaxing time, but it's also called a holy day. A holy day isn't relaxing. It's a day of devotion. It's a day of greater worship. It's not downtime. On Shabbos, I am after Shabbos, less, um, uh, I'm more uh, tired than I am during the weekday. Yeah, there's a davening, there's a learning, there's fabringen, you know, it, 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 it's the opposite. I need, uh, I need the vacation from Shabbos. God forbid. I don't need a vacation from Shabbos, but you need the, the relaxing day after Shabbos, you know, so that's why we have Sunday. <laughs> but it, it, it doesn't seem to jive if that's because God rested, so we rest. And then finally, we need to understand what does it mean that Shabbos is holy? Well, so let's get a little um, insight over here. All right. So Shabbos is a day of rest. Reimagining the essence of Shabbos. All right. Let's get to the very verse in Genesis. We say it every Friday night by Kiddush. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. For on it he rested from all of his work. All right. What is this telling us very clearly? That the last thing that God does is bless Shabbos and he makes it holy. And why did God make Shabbos a holy day? How come? Because he rested on it. So obviously there must be some kind of connection over here between resting and holiness. But we need to understand, how so? Why is it because God rested that automatically makes it a holy day? What is it about the resting that makes it holy? Resting should just make it casual, downtime. What is in the concept of resting that is inherently making it holy? So the next reading will give us something more to understand of God's resting. By resting, God gifted the world with something special. The world was complete. Rashi says, 
What was the word lacking? Rest. Along came Shabbos, along came rest. With this, the work of creation was complete. So the final thing that God created on Friday afternoon to make the world complete, we thought was, you know, the creation of man. But no, Rashi's telling us that the world was not complete. There was a critical thing missing in the world. And what's that called? Menucha, rest. How did God introduce rest into the world? By resting, right? So it turns out that the final act of creation is not an active thing that God does, right? Because the action of whatever he's doing is rendering the world incomplete. When does it become complete? On Shabbos, when God does the opposite. He's not doing anything active. He's resting. And from that resting, we have completion. I have a question. Sure. Did, didn't um, didn't he, didn't God sanctify the Sabbath by um, giving a double portion of manna? So wouldn't that be considered kind of working on Sabbath? Well, we got the double portion on Friday. We okay, so last. Okay, all right. Right. That's why it's a double portion for Friday and and for Shabbos, okay. right? All right. We have a double portion of challah on Shabbos to remember that God gave a double portion Friday. One for Friday's food and one for Shabbos' food, right? That's, okay. So again, how does the world become complete? Because he did something? No, because God didn't. By inaction, by resting, that brings a completion to the world. How do we understand that? How is the resting on Shabbos fit into making a completion of the world? Obviously, there must be something much more deeper here in what this concept of rest is. It's obviously not just desisting from work that you did for the six weeks. And obviously, the concept of holy, because you desisted from work, because God rested, and you desist from work, has to have a much deeper implication in order that this is what renders this day holy. Are we clear on everything? Yeah? I want to welcome, I see some uh, faces that I didn't welcome earlier, Ahuva uh, and Irma, Diane, uh, Celia, I think, uh, David, I didn't, and Joel. Whoever can keep their cameras on, that's great. And for those that can't, it's also great. <laughs> um, welcome to one, a 206 phone number. That's you. Okay. You're there twice. Ah, <laughs> got it. Perfect. Okay. Let's back up. So again, we have difficulties here. What are our difficulties? To understand what it means God rested. What does it mean that it's a holy day? It's holy because he rested. Obviously, resting cannot mean just an inaction of desisting from work. And that's what defines the day holy. It must be something much more profound. And as we see, we do many things on Shabbos expressing holiness, and they're not desisting from work. Davening, learning, fabringen, you know, gathering around the table, making meals with lavish food. I mean, you could do that, but that shouldn't be defined as desisting from work that makes the day holy. So obviously there has to be something much deeper in this concept of God resting that creates holiness. <coughs> Are we clear on the issue? Yeah? Right. 
Okay. So we need to back up a bit and understand a little bit about creation. And this is a concept that we've learned many times. We're going to be learning it soon in the second part of Tanya in great detail and great length, right? So we all know that God is infinite. What does it mean he's infinite? He means he's everywhere. There's no place that God is not. Not only he's not, he's everywhere, he's everything, right? Before God created the world, there only existed him. After he creates the world, well, there's still only but him. So then the obvious question is, um, how do we fit into the picture? How's creation fit into the picture? How is it that if God is the only reality, um, that there could be myself, you, anything else in creation? And where does it fit into creation? How do we understand that? Right? So the Kabbalists give us an understanding. And in one word, what is the concept that we need to understand that will give us an understanding? How is there from an infinite God that is everywhere and everything, there's still a me and a you and a universe? Anybody? What's that one word? What co the concept? Separation. Separation is correct, but that's the result of this thing. Tsum. Ah, oh, Huva, way to go. Tsum, contraction. Teachings of the Arizal. Before the Arizal, we just didn't have an understanding of how from an infinite God there could be a finite creation that is um, that we have a sense of separateness from God. We just, you know, took on faith. The Arizal gave us the understanding, Tsimtsum. Tsimtsum means that God contracted upon his infinite light. He didn't contract himself out, that it's not there. What did he do? He concealed it. He hid it from our sight, from our experience, from our awareness, right? That we could perceive ourselves as independent, separate entities, like Reggie, like you said, um, that, e that exist independent of God. That's the human condition, right? An analogy for that, you know, the sun on a nice day, it's beautiful, it's nice to have, but sometimes the sun is so strong and so powerful that when you look at it, it's blinding. It's too much light. That light doesn't allow me to see. So what do I need? I need to filter the light. How? something called sunglasses, right? That filters the light. What is it doing? Is it taking the way of the light? No, it's just filtering it, contracting it, enabling me to be able to see a, a reduced light and therefore have pleasure from that light that it's enlightening rather than <laughs> blinding, right? Likewise, another metaphor for this, is an electrical transformer. Outside of our house, we have transformers that are of a 440 um, kilo, I don't know, kilowatts, is it? Or whatever it's called, um, right? Then it comes into the house as a 220. And for a 220, you can get a um, washing machine and a, and a dryer to work because that's, well, the dryer at least works on the 220. But a regular outlet works on a 110. What happened? From the transformer outside at a 440, it comes into the house at 220. From 220 goes and it's reduced the electrical power. It's lessened to a 110. Then now you can have a function of plugging in and actually getting some connection of electricity, power to energize the you know, the, the, the phone that we use to energize the computer that we're using and so on. 
what would happen if we would plug it into a, a 220? Be overpowering and destroy the instrument. Be too much. 440, oh my gosh. So it's a reduction of the divine power of God through Tsimtsum that allows that we should exist. Our existence. That we be able um, because it would be too powerful if his divine light was not contracted, that we would be only but aware of God, that we're absorbed in a part of him. So, as we have in the reading before us, from the Alter Rebbe in Tanya, chapter four of the uh, forthcoming Part two of Tanya, God's power restrained, is the quality of Tzimtzum, concealment, whereby he withholds his great expansiveness and prevents it from, be, from descending and being revealed to created beings. Rather than animating all of creation openly, he operates in concealment to create the impression that the created being exists independently from God. Remember, it's an impression from our point of view, not from God. Not from God's point of view. God's point of view, we're a part of him, but not from ours. We're independent from God. Though the created being has no independent existence, nevertheless, the restraining power of the omnipotent God conceals the spiritual life force that flows from him so that not to null uh, nullify the existence of the created being. Again, what would happen? What would happen if the if we're getting a, an energy field of 440? You know, we wouldn't be able to have this conversation on Zoom right now. It'd be the energy field would be too great and would, you know, zap it out. <laughs> what would happen if the light of the sun is so powerful? It would be blinding. I wouldn't be able to see. So the light of God would be too great. We wouldn't be able to see. Meaning I see means there's an I that's seeing because I would be blinded in the fact that I would be just encompassed by this light of God that would be greater than me and be absorbed in it. I wouldn't feel my sense of independence. Is that clear? So it's interesting. We have two opposite things happening at the same time. Two contrary things. On one hand, our existence is totally dependent on God. He's creating me. But on the other hand, in his act of creation, he is concealing himself. Why? That I could be perceive myself as an independent being from my perspective. Now, we can appreciate this further in creation. How? Because there's different uh, levels, degrations of creation. You have inanimate, vegetation, animal, human, angels. What's the difference? Why is an animal an animal? Why is a rock a rock? Because of how much the light of God is contracted. The more the light is contracted, the more it's concealed, means what it creates is a greater concealment on God. Well, when you look at a rock, right, generally speaking, you don't perceive as much the light of God in a rock. Why? It's inanimate. It doesn't move. It's lifeless. And it's not lifeless. God is animating it. But the contracted light is so great that it seems lifeless. Vegetation has a little more life to it. It's rooted in the soil. It grows into an edible fruit-bearing tree or flowers or whatever. It's beautiful. So there we see a little more life. Animals, even more. They roam. They have a, uh, they, they, they have a life, so to speak. And of course, human. And then angels who are so acutely aware. Why are they so acutely aware? Because in the spiritual worlds, beyond this physical world, the light of God is not so contracted 
and therefore they have an awareness. And even there, you have levels of angels. You have oifanim that are on a lower level. They don't perceive precisely um, the, 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 where God is. Srafim are on a higher level. Oifanim are like winged angels. Srafim are burnt from the word saruf, burnt. They're burnt up in their love of God because the closest uh, uh, to, to the light of God is burning them up with great love and devotion. Again, why? Because the light is greater in the world of the Saraf than in the Oifani, and much greater than in our world. Is that clear? All make sense? Any question on that? But how come it's in Atzilut, for example, it's not nullified? I, I didn't catch yeah. the what, how come Why it, are things not nullified in Atsilut, for example, where the light is very strong, where the light is, there's just godliness? In Atsilut, they are. But they're nullified? They are, they're nullified. Yeah, they're one with God. Yeah, that's why the we have angels have that's, identity. That's why, that's, why, that's why we haven't visited there too often, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there are very few angels that are of Atsilut. Angels are mainly of Yitzira. And Bria. Okay, know, thank you. They're mainly uh, in, in, on those levels. Now, the loftiest of the righteous, their souls come from Atsilus. Right? Um, and their souls are so illuminated with the light of God that they um, have that attachment. Now, they have that attachment in their soul, but they have to work on themselves to um, refine that. As we learned in Tanya today, right? Because everything always ties in somehow, <laughs> some way, right? That um, refining themselves in such a manner that their body isn't a, an impediment to their soul being, the, and their soul coming from such a lofty place like Avatsilus, which by the way, all of our souls come from there. The difference is some of our souls or most of our souls also pick up other things on the way down as they migrate into this world, right? Um, the, the complete righteous tzaddik doesn't have that migration and picking up the things that kind of um, were, were um, you know, on the way coming down. And therefore they have the capacity when they work on themselves in such a way that they transform the, their body and animal soul that it no longer becomes an impediment to their lives, right? Which for the rest of us, it is. They are able to perceive the light of God in their soul that is much loftier than what we're able to. Okay, but that's the righteous. Okay, but here we're, not, we're, here we're talking about the act of creation. That was a, a digression for the moment. Here we're talking about, again, how God creates the world. So we understand this concept, right? Now, in that act of creation, does God ever, so to speak, reverse things, change things up? Does that ever happen? In other words, um, you know, God's animating with a contracted light. And that contraction is kind of reversed. Does that ever occur? So the answer is yes. And guess when that occurs? Miracles and wonders. Good, excellent. How about on a more, um, yes, excellent, right? Miracles and wonders. Thank you, Olga, beautiful. How about on a more regular basis? When you say prayers and do Torah study, aren't you somehow connecting? If God's allowing you to connect because he's contracting as you're studying Torah and... So, well, there, there was never a contraction though. Very good. See, Torah study and mitzvah is not creation. That's God's will. And there, there is no contraction. It is an expression of him every time you do a, a mitzvah. Right, because the mitzvah is his will. It is like 
the limb of God is. It's one of the limbs, figuratively speaking, 248. So when you are doing the mitzvah of tzedakah, for example, you're doing one of the limbs of God. And what does that mean? The limb of God is now embracing you. But that is not part of creation, Torah and mitzvahs. That's beyond creation. What's in creation? That there is a reversal of Tzimtzum. Shabbos. Oh, Davida, way to go. You got it. Shabbos. Shabbos is exactly that. What happens six days a week? We're working. We're wor working in a world that the light of God is concealed. Where we are, we don't feel the presence. I mean, we got to work. It's not naturally there. There's a concealment on the light of God. So they come Shabbos, it's peeled away. God is more pronounced. God is more real on Shabbos. As the Rebbe Rashab explains, this concept of divine rest is to refrain from tzimtzum. Elohim created on the seventh day. Elohim is the name of God that represents God's capacity for restraint and concealment. And on Shabbos, the tzimtzum implied by the name Elohim expired. God rested from the act of tzimtzum. Something similar occurs every week on Shabbos. On this day, God rests from the act of concealment, and the divine light is revealed without the veil of tzimtzum, making us aware that we are standing before the king. Let's uh, unpack this idea. Now we can understand what it means that God rested. What do you mean he rested? He stopped doing something. What did he do? What did he stop? Concealing. Restraining. Tzimtzum. He stopped it. That's what he did. Tzimtzum is what makes God, uh, the creation possible that we could be separate from God. Right? But God rests from that concealment. He withdrew drew from it. And the creator becomes much more identified now with this day called Shabbos as a result. So now we can understand what it means that God rested on this day. Rest means that he made it holy. Because he rested, he made it holy. Remember, we had, well, what has resting got to do with holiness? Because resting doesn't mean a casual relaxation vacation day. That's not what it means. Rest means he rested from him being the active creator, which is creating through concealment. That's how he creates a rock. That's how he creates vegetation, animal, human, even angels. But on this day, it's a greater illumination. God is revealed. He is revealing his light. Now, he, he didn't do it just on the first, you know, the, the, the seventh day of creation. He does it every week. Every week, there's a fluctuation. We engage in a world doing our own thing. You know why we're doing our own thing? Because we, we feel me as a thing. Because God contracts on the light to such a degree that I feel me as a thing. So much so I've got to do this thing called making a livelihood. I got to do this thing. I got to feed my family. I got to take care of things. Because I feel the separateness. Shabbos, God ceases from that action. Allows us now to be attuned to not things anymore that God does. He reveals himself. In Kabbalistic terminology, we use called it's a it's alias a malchus. Malchus, what is malchus, folks? Sovereignty, royalty, kingship. 
God rules as a king. How? Through his word. Through his word, he is creating. The word of God is a contraction. Just as my word, I have to contract it and condense it from the way it's thought in my head, right? The way it's in my head, I got to contract it into very specific words because in my mind, the light is brighter. I got to bring it down into very specific words that a word is a container for a very specific idea. So there's clarity. That's a contraction. That's how God creates through the world. Shabbos, Malchus, that power of God as creator is now going to its source. So God is creating the word through the week. On Shabbos, it's being elevated. It's like the word going into thought. Malchus is extending to its source. During the week, God is breathing out. As we speak, we breathe out. God is speaking creation, breathing out and creating. When the breath comes out, there's a separateness from our perspective, right? In the word, the breath that comes out. What does God do on Shabbos? Breathing in, bringing it inwards and upwards, exalting it to a higher source where that light is much more pronounced, illuminated, not so contracted. That's what God does. Is that clear? So with this, we can understand the very words themselves. It's like, wow. I'm sure you're not, you're not going to be able to wait till Shabbos now. Vayichal <laughs> Elohim. Vayoyim Hashvi. Right? What does that mean? How do we translate that? Hmm? So the, the ordinary translation, Vayachal, means that God completed. Vayayim Ashvi, on the seventh day. Right? But it can also, Vayachal means God expired on the seventh day. God expired? God doesn't expire. Yes. Vayachal Elohim. What's Elohim? Simsu. Contraction. It expired. The contraction. Yom Hashvi on the seventh day. God doesn't contract himself anymore. He is far greater illuminated. The act of God is breathing out the word to animate a world is now as we need to have life. You can't just have life by breathing out. You need to breathe in. And when you breathe in, you breathe in into a deeper place from within. As Malchus has its aliyah to its root source, as speech is now coming into thought. During the week, we're connected to God's speech. As the word comes out of me, so we have that detachment, that separation. Again, that's only from our perspective, remember. In reality, we're only a part of God. But that's the nature of the human condition of the six days. The seventh day, the speech is brought back in. From speech, it comes into thought, elevation. Of the, of the human condition into a much more non-restricted divine light as it is, so to speak, in the thought of God. And just like in our thoughts, it's much more illuminated our uh, the idea that we have. 
when we put it into word is much more you know contracted but likewise it is there and that's what we experience on Shabbos and that's why we're able to be much more attuned and connected to God on Shabbos and that's why when um, as Shabbos enters what happens we get a second soul an additional measure of a soul is given to us on friday afternoon and is taken uh, from us saturday night after shabbos this is derived from the verse on the, on the seventh day shabbos vayinafash he rested and he refreshed these hebrew words form the abbreviation of kivan uh the shafat the the Avda Nefesh, once Shabbos ends, whoa, our additional soul is lost. So in Shabbos, we get the extra soul. What does it mean? We get the extra capability of being attuned to the fact that God isn't contracting the, the, the light of him on this day as it is, as he does contract upon it through the six days. So we get an extra soul so we can be privy to that. We can be connected to that. And therefore, there's a melancholy, melancholy when Shabbos leaves. And that's why we need to revive our spirit. And how do we do that? Of course, with besamim, by smelling the besamim, the fragrance, when Shabbos leaves. In other words, there's something that's markedly different in how we experience Shabbos than the weekday. Is that also why we have a Mlava Maka after Shabbos? Exactly. Because why? We want to kind of allow our soul to feel the extension of Shabbos and that, you know, that the departure shouldn't be so abrupt. And, and, and this, the, the glare or the glow of Shabbos is still upon us. So therefore we have Mlava Maka. We are escorting the queen. That experience, we're still having a glow of it, so we still have something left of it. Therefore, we make that extra meal after Shabbos in order that we can extend a little bit of Shabbos throughout the week, that it should affect the rest of the week. That when we come into the six days that we work, that it shouldn't be such a doggy dog world, such a, you know, a concealment on the light of God, but we're taking Shabbos with us in order that sh that the rest of the week could be permeated with some of the light of Shabbos. And Malava Malka is sort of that transition point. Thank you, Leah. And we can all feel it, by the way. As the major says, a person's face is incomparably more radiant on Shabbos than the rest of the week. You hear that? We could be attuned to it. And I, I wager to say that we are. I'll give you an example. Some of us might be addicts to our cell phone. And I've even noticed sometimes people are using it like really to the last moment before Shabbos. But when Shabbos comes, all of a sudden, there's no craving for it. There's no need for it. It's like, what, like, what happened? Now, okay, on, a, on one level, you could say, well, no, I know I can't, so therefore, you know, I do without. But that doesn't answer why you at least strongly urge it. Okay, so you hold yourself back. <laughs> I know many people have real problems with it. And they don't urge for it at all on Shabbos. How come? Well, as we just said, we are incomparably more radiant on that day. Some more, some less, but we all are. It's not whether you are rich or poor, smart or not. Everyone is. Now, again, the more we are attuned to the, the, this truth and the more we work on ourselves, of course, the more it will become something that will radiate 
us more, just as like a rock is, you know, one level of divine um, animation and, you know, animal is obviously much greater. But there's no doubt that we, we are illuminated by this. Tell the story of the original Rebbe when he was five years old and when his Rebbe, uh, original Rebbe lived in, uh, in the 19th century and when his, um, when he was learning in, in, in Cheder, I'm speaking about when the Shabbos begin. So he's telling about, you know, three stars and or, or, or uh, sunset and so on. So he says, I don't understand. I just go out and you can see, look, pick up your head and you can see when Shabbos begins. Now, the original Rebbe was a holy, became a holy man. Even at five years old, he had, you know, holiness uh, within his uh, his soul that was he was connected to. And he was able to perceive that truth. So we may not be so uh, lucky to, but that truth is definitely there. As you know, um, when you make a wedding, so after a wedding, you have Sheva Brachas. And the law of Sheva Brachas, that you can make the seven lo- the seven blessings, you have to have what's called a Panim Chadashas. Panim Chadashas means a new face. If you don't have a new face by the Sheva Brachas, then you can't make those blessings. You need someone, why? why a new face? Because a new face means someone who wasn't there by the wedding for that celebration. They came now for the celebration. So the fact that they weren't there and they're new to the celebration, it's adding something, a new face, new celebration, right? Like, you know, you have the party with the same people all the time and a new face comes, oh, it adds something to the celebration, right? right. So here, the wedding, seven days afterwards, you're doing Sheva Brachos, so you're adding something. The law is when it comes Shabbos, you don't need a new face. Why? Shabbos is the new face. So the Rebbe explains, actually, it's not Shabbos, it's the new face. Who's the new face? Who's the new face? Us. We are. Each and every single one of us. Shabbos means we're just not the same person anymore. Why? Because God is illuminating the world. Ah, the original could tell exactly precisely when it starts. We we won't. But most definitely, we're just not the same people. That's why we don't dress the same. And we don't act the same. You could say it's the other, you know, oh, the law says don't dress, dress Shabbos dick. Right? Dress your Shabbos dig, dress your best on Shabbos, and so on. No, that, it's the other way around. It's because the law is expressing the reality. It's not like dress Shabbos dig because you know you got to make Shabbos different than the weekday. No, no, it's because Shabbos is different than the weekday. Not that you have to make it. It is. God's breathing in, not out. It's not his word. It's his, it, It's an expression of his thought that we're connecting to. A much deeper place. Much profound connection. There isn't a contraction. God stopped his work. Well, God's work is contraction. To hold back. To allow us to feel our independence. Shabbos? No. Shabbos, we need to feel dependent. We need to feel we're enveloped back, being incubated back in our source within God. Can I ask you about the resting part? Go ahead. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember the resting part um how we're supposed to be resting and it's not resting and i don't get the correlation resting we, we explain what what, what do we explain the resting is is god resting he's no. resting from contraction right but us. he stopped by means he desists 
cease and desist from contraction of him. He is more illuminated in the world that day. The Rishna Rebbe could see it in the sky. Exactly the moment that Shabbos begins. We see it because we are different. I could live without that cell phone. For someone who's a, you know, I, I've seen people smokers. No one should smoke. Very bad idea. But someone who smokes, Shabbos, they have no urge for it. They're addicted. No urge. Where's that come from? Because they're different people. Why are they different? What the law says, you got to make, you got to be different on Shabbos. That's what the law says. The law is a, ref, a reflection of the reality. The reality is Shabbos is different. That's why your Shabbos candles, you can't light it one minute into Shabbos. That's all contrary to the reality. You have to light before Shabbos. Ah, it's about my feeling of what being Shabbos, Nick. And in the wintertime, I can't light it on time for whatever. No, it's not about your feeling. It's not about you. It's about a reality. What's the reality? Six days a week, God is contracting the light that we feel a real separateness. Shabbos, no. God is not only much more available. Why is he available? Because he's not contracting his divine light as he does during the weekday. He's breathing in. He's giving us from his generator, not 110, 220, 440, whatever it is, right? <laughs> giving us energy that is far and above beyond the human condition. It's making us privy to something that we can connect to that otherwise is not available. <laughs> because God stopped working, he ceased. Elohim. Elohim is the name of God that is the contraction, the refrain of the divine light, that saw. And that's why Shabbos is complete, because it brought menucha, rest. Why, why rest? Not because I'm sitting and relaxing. Shabbos is more engaging day, because I'm engaged now in a divine level that I'm not able to reach during the week because God is availing the light to me in such a profound, unrestricted manner that as a result, I'm not, I'm, go, I'm going to sleep. I'm going to go to sleep on Shabbos. You're going to engage on Shabbos. You're going to dive in more. You're going to learn more. You're going to sit with the family and friends and, and, and tell more stories and more Dvar Torahs and more, and more life. Because that's an expression of what God is giving now. More life. So much so that you need a Sunday after your Shabbos. <laughs> Is that clear? So as the Rebbe says in the Sicha, these are the two poles that are expected of the Jew. During six days, when the Torah mandates that we concern ourselves with our material body, working is a mitzvah. Nevertheless, on Shabbos, Jewish holidays, when the soul is more radiant, we must transcend our body, its concerns, and its nature. It is self-understood that work is out of the question during these days. Right? Again, what do we mean? Just work is out of the equation? As the Rebbe explains, as we just explained, elaborated resting on Shabbos doesn't mean that the absence of work right is that the God stopped working stop God stopped revealing now I mean contracting so he could reveal himself so what do we got to do reveal ourselves so not only do uh, not only do we work to serve God on Shabbos 
but our work is also of a higher order. Because God is of a higher order, we reflect back a higher order. We must therefore conclude that resting on Shabbos means to work in a manner that is restful and delightful. That is to say, it is not considered laborious at all because it is a pleasure to engage in such work. Simple example, if we're given permission to gather as many gems and diamonds as we could, we would spare no effort in carrying out the heaviest load that we could possibly lift. Though this would entail strain, toil, and perspiration, it would not be considered strenuous or burdensome. On the contrary, the heavier the load, the more delightful we would be. So what is Shabbos? You gotta, we got to load. I got to learn so much. I got to dive in so much. I've got to fabring and say l'chaim and to, to sing more melodies and to sing more heartfelt, deep connections and more meditation. It's strenuous, but it's a gem. It's beautiful. It's unbelievable. God is not veiled. The light is there. I have that extra soul that I can connect to it. So I may do the most that I can to truly connect. So where do we get this Shainab uh, Shabbat Tanug from the acronym Shabbat? See, that's the beauty of God Almighty. And that's the beauty of Torah. There's so many levels of what it means, Shabbos, that we can engage in. So, as I once heard from Dr. Block, blessed memory, we came to Shabbaton, we went, we had it several times here, Chabad House in Montreal. So he said, Shina B'Shabbos Tainuk, right? Sleeping on Shabbos is a pleasure. Which is the acronym, uh, the acronym of the word Shabbos. So you can imagine if sleeping on Shabbos is a pleasure and you even have a mitzvah from that, could you imagine what it means to learn on Shabbos? Could you imagine what it means to daven rigorously on Shabbos? Could you imagine what it means to bring a whole day on Shabbos? To gather around friends and family and to ins be inspired, to inspire on Shabbos? Can you imagine how great that is? If mere sleeping is, imagine how great that is. So we have the choice. We could have the rock felt, the rock type of Shabbos, or we can have the angel type of Shabbos. Right? That's really up to us. So God allows that we can even have such a level. But, of course, if we recognize it's a gem, so we want to have the we want to have the most precious gems on Shabbos. If I can, if I if I'm given the most precious gems, to have some fake or not fake or some I don't know, just uh, you know, some rock formation, <laughs> if I can have a precious gem. So that's the inner dimension of what Shabbos is. See what we explained here is according to Hasidic teachings, according to Rebbe's Sicha. Of course you could, you know, there is the bottom line of Shabbos. Don't work. <laughs> right? Don't work. And that's the simple meaning of Shabbos. God rested. He didn't work. So we could have such a Shabbos, but then we're missing on the true inner intent of what Shabbos is. It's not meant to be merely a casual day, as we just learned right? A slumber day. It's meant to be an enlightening, enlightenment, a soulful day, not a merely, you know, that's what it's meant. So, yeah, the, as I've said many times, uh, Leah, if, you, if you've heard from me before, Judaism is like the truck driver religion. Even a truck driver could be a good Jew. And I don't mean anybody, God forbid, is a truck driver that that means they're bad. But truck driver, you know, the 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 the, the metaphor of the truck driver, you know, person might not be the most refined individual, 
and I'm sure there's many truck drivers that are very refined. So I'm using this only as a, me a metaphor, right? <laughs> so don't, you know, uh, only as a metaphor. So don't get carried away with the metaphor. In other words, even a person who is not exactly the most spiritual of people, most refined, right? Even that person can be a good Jew and keep Shabbos. Yeah, their Shabbos are going to be into, you know, having this meat versus that meat. Having this uh, good food versus that food. And you know what? There's room for that. Right? Now, to make it all about the food. So there's some people, that's their Shabbos. They delight in the great food. That's something. It's better than working for the food on Shabbos. That's better. But that's not the inner aspect of really what Shabbos is all about. The inner component. There's the external and the deeper. And what we've explained over here is that deeper meaning of what Shabbos really is. And truthfully, the only reason a person is only would be into that is because we just are comfortable with our uh, pleasure-seeking ways as opposed to rigorous, soulful engagement. Right? And that that's work. It's Shabbos Dikka work. But what kind of work is it? It's when you're, you have a mind that you can find those gems. You're going to, you don't fall, call that work. Gems, diamonds, and they're all there and I could gather all them all up. I don't feel that that's work. Are you going to sweat? Yeah. Is it going to be a real engagement? Absolutely. Is it a casual time? Not if you want to make it, if you want to get the wealth. It's not casual at all. So that's a real Shabbos. I invite everybody to Chavad Zuch and Kedoshin. If you want to experience our davening is slow, we sing a lot. I mean, I'm sure it's, you know, you, you can experience it at any Chabad house, but I invite you here anyways. <laughs> Only because I'd like to have you here. Um, after, COVID. after COVID. After <laughs> COVID. After <laughs> COVID. Uh, slow davening. We uh, then have a, a beautiful meal with with good food. Absolutely. After all, it is Shabbos, and we want to talk to you know we need to talk to the animal soul also in the body, and to get in it you know to be engaged. And we for bring we say lachaim we tell stories we. Boy, would I like to. <laughs> Shabbat, but I can't because I can't walk that far. I come from Cote St. Luke. Yeah. How do you get around that when you can't drive? You can't get around. You can't, you can't work. You can't do that. So listen, you're going to have to do So obviously God has given you the power that you could do it on your own in your place. <laughs> <laughs> obviously you have that power. <laughs> okay. So, There's Chabad in Kot St. Luke. Rabbi Raskin in Kot St. Luke, you can walk to. Yeah, but I'd like to go to Rabbi Fine's. Yeah, like, but, you know, okay. Got a Shabbaton. He, has, he has wonderful things, and I'd like to pray with his Siddur. Yeah. So I guess you, you're, you're uh, you know, you're very capable of doing it on your own. That's I what guess I, so. Must, I'll must, have to go to Biba, Beth Israel, Beth Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> Is it not allowed to have someone drive you? No. No. Really? Even a non-Jew? No. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, part of the challenge is. Hmm. Part of the challenge is, yeah. But, um, yeah, we got, you know, I now with COVID, it's very difficult, you know, especially here in Montreal, no one's allowed in your home. So we haven't had anybody, guests besides fa some family members um, at our home or, you know, to stay over or anything like that. 
but you know, you can stay over. Some places COVID never existed in the States. <laughs> and now for sure it doesn't. Um, and that you can, uh, you know, stay over it, maybe at your local Chabad. Yeah. Anyways, this is the beauty. Any um, questions, comments, thoughts? Beautiful idea. Bev, I have a quick question. Sure, go ahead. Liba. What, thank you. What about the, um, the Jew who does not observe Shabbat? Do they still feel it in the same way, but the only difference is their choice in acting upon it? Obviously, they're not feeling it the same way. You know, that's for sure not. Remember, you're getting an additional soul. What does that mean? If your body and animal soul are weighing you down and are, are covering up on your soul, so an additional soul, you know, might eke through something, but, you know, the more our... Our, our body is and our pleasure seeking ways are the, you know, what's primary. So it's going to be harder to be attuned to that soul. It's there, it's more available, you know, but we need to be attuned to it. And, and, and by the way, that's why it works the opposite way also. Remember I said, why do we wear, why do we wear different clothes on Shabbos, Shabbos Dika clothes? Why are we wearing the best food? And so on. So I said, it's not really because of the, because the halacha says so. The, well, I mean, the halacha doesn't. It's because this is a an exp, this is the true reality of the day. In other words, the day is more illuminated with the divine. So therefore, we dress differently, we act differently, we eat differently, and pray differently, and so on and so forth. Now. That's now that you learned the class and you know the, the, the inner truth. But for someone who isn't holding by that, so you know what? Dress differently on Chavez. You know why? Because that's what the law says. Ah, because you're not attuned to it. Okay, you're not there. So dress differently. Act differently. You know why? Because that's what Jewish law tells you to do. Ah, you're not there. So start with something. The Rebbe... Someone came to the Rebbe, I'm, I'm, I don't know if it's Yechidus, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, private audience. I, I, I don't remember, maybe it was a letter, I don't remember what the context was. But the person, you know, wanted something of Shabbos, but wasn't ready to give up work. Wasn't ready. So the Rebbe said, and listen to this, it's pretty, pretty awesome. Um, go to work 15 minutes later. And those 15 minutes that he didn't go to work, he desists. God was revealed at that moment to him. Oh, that I almost said 15 minutes. Go to work later. Of course, what happened? That helped him to get refined from 15 minutes, came a half hour, came, came the morning, and he only went in the afternoon. And eventually, he didn't go at all. In other words, Shabbos isn't all or nothing. Start with something. Start with something. As uh, the Rebbe told the story, famous uh, story in Eretz Israel, in Israel uh, as Chabad was going around uh, and they uh, to the uh, to the Jewish kids in schools, and a little girl came, um, and uh, with Shabbos candles because she got that from the Chabad that came to the school. She said she wanted to light Shabbos candles, but family was very secular. So no, no, we don't do that. And um, took away the candles from the girl. So um, 
it could be I've got some of the details not exact over here, but uh, that's okay. That's the, the idea of the story here. So uh, the following week, the girl was very intent. A little girl, eight years old or something, very intent. She was very moved and she wanted to light Shabbos candles. Her soul <laughs> had the extra soul on Shabbos. And so she went to the local, um, she didn't have Shabbos candles, it was taken away from her. So she went to the local and she said, she, she asked the, in the store, she wanted the, 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 the Jewish candle. She didn't even say the Shabbos candles. So the storekeeper didn't know Jewish candle. Gave a Yorzeit licht. <laughs> Excuse me. My spring allergies. Gave Yorzeit licht. You know what Yorzeit licht is, right? 24 hour candle for someone who passed away. So that Friday, she figured she's going to sneak it and quietly do it, and her mother won't see until it's done. The deed is done. And so she lights the candles, she makes the bracha, whatever she knows, and then her mother sees it, and to her horror, says, what are you doing? So it's Shabbos, Shabbat. I want to light the candle. She says, but that's not a Shabbos candle, that's a... You know, for someone who passed away, you know, the kid didn't understand. We were, you know, very confused, and the mother would go. Anyways, from the innocence of that child, she says, "Okay, uh, don't worry. Next week we're gonna give you and gave her the Shabbos candles, and then they lit the Shabbos candles, and they said, can't watch television now if the Shabbos candles are lit.' So they only watch television after they went out. But then afterwards, one thing led to another. Baruch Hashem. Now they're keeping Shabbos. So it's not all or nothing, you know, this notion. The truth of it is the truth. It's absolute. Our engagement in it, our commitment to it, um, you know, if we're ready for absolute commitment, absolutely beautiful. If you're not ready for it, you're just ready to make Friday night kiddish, lighting your Shabbos candles on time, of course, and uh, going out afterwards. That's a beginning. Absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. But we need to grow from level to level. So what we spoke about is the absoluteness of the truth of what Shabbos is. Our being not absolute people not being absolutely truthful people, absolutely ready for absolute commitment. Okay, not, uh, the truth is, none of us are, not even me. You know, Chabas, uh, you know, uh, I might sleep even, Leia. <laughs> Matter of fact, this Shabbos, I said, middle of so I fell asleep. <laughs> or I might not be so, you know, engaged in the learning. You know, feeling a little casual. Am I absolute? None of us are absolute. The truth and God is absolute. We need to grow from level to level, wherever we're at on that ladder. We need to go upwards. So, you know, if someone is driving to shul and that's where they're at, okay, they're at least doing that. They're going to shul. Or whatever, or there. I mean, maybe that's not a good example of it because that's, I mean, the short part perhaps is, um, or they're only again making kiddush, lighting the Shabbos candles, and after that, you know, they're chilling out in other ways. You got to move up the ladder. That's what counts. Is that clear? We're good. Beautiful. All right, folks. God bless you all. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Rabbi, real quick. Sure. Uva. The the JLI class does it start this week or the next week? Next in May? week. Oh, thank you for uh, reminding me. May the fifth, not this Wednesday. The May following, the following Wednesday. Wednesday. Whoever didn't sign up yet, you don't want to miss this. I promise you. So the books have gone out. The books are going out this week. Okay. Yeah. Can we just call your daughter to sign up with her? Uh, Rena, call Rena. Call, call, call the office. Yeah, call Rena. Yeah, okay. 
Yeah, I think many of you have already signed up. Whoever, uh, actually, many of you, all, almost all of you. Great. You'll awesome. send the flyer, right? Yeah, just call I think the, the rabbis. Office. Already sent some emails. Yeah, I know. We sent. We've sent many emails. Yeah, don't worry. We're going to bother you more. Good. <laughs> you know why? Because if you only signed up, that's not good enough. There's others to sign up. Got to share the wealth. <laughs> right. Sign up others. Sometimes it's the greatest gift you can give in their lives. Gift it to them. I have to go. Goodbye. All right, folks. Thank Thank you. You. We'll have see you tomorrow morning you for Tanya. 9.30 in the morning. Tanya. Thank yes. you, guys. Yes. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank Bye. you, Rabbi. Bye. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye. Good luck. Be well. Thank you, Rabbi. Good book. <laughs>